It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Speaker. Speaker, before, before I get started, on behalf of, um, I suspect, all MPPs in the Legislature, I think it's appropriate to give a warm welcome to the 2,513 to 21-year-old athletes and their coaches that are here in the GTA this week to participate in the first Special Olympics Ontario Invitational Youth Games. The Special Olympics uh, showcase incredible talent and also incredible values, and so it's great to uh, have these athletes competing. Congratulations to everyone involved, and good luck in, uh, in success in your sport. Um, my question, my question, uh, Speaker, is the um, is to the Premier. Uh, yesterday, the City of Toronto announced that in addition to the $85 million reduction in funding to public health that they're already grappling with, uh, the Premier plans to slash yet another $20 million from their budget. The government has opted to surprise them with this round of cuts, just like they did the first ones. Why are municipalities being hit with cut after cut with no warning, no consultation and no apparent plan? Questions to the Premier. Minister of Health. Or to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the question. But we have already communicated with the City of Toronto that we will be providing them with $114 million for public health for the coming year, and that there is no suggestion, there has been no announcement, and nothing has come from the Ministry of Health to the City of Toronto to suggest that there's any further changes to that original plan. Whatever was announced yesterday was announced. I, I have no idea why, but it was not from our office. There is no truth in any suggestion that there is any change to the original announcement that we will provide $114 million for public health to the City of Toronto, regardless of any changes or whatever else they do. That that money will be provided by the by the uh, Ministry of Health. Supplementary. Well, I think what the minister responded is uh, exactly reflective of the problem we have, Speaker. If the government has a plan for public health, they haven't shared it with the people on the front lines who actually do the work every day. In North Bay, they're wondering whether their brand new health unit will soon be abandoned. Medical officers of health across Ontario are wondering how their local units can be merged without sacrificing the needs of their communities. And every municipality is wondering if there's yet another cut the Ford government government is waiting to spring on them. If the government has a plan, why are so many frontline public health providers in the dark about it? Minister. Well, to you, Mr. Speaker, I would like to say to the Leader of the Official Opposition that there has been very co clear communication with both the City of Toronto and with the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. In fact, a letter went out to them yesterday indicating that with respect to the boundaries and with respect to the money has already been discussed, but with respect to the boundaries, I understand there have been some suggestions the out there that the boundaries have been completed. They have not. They are going to be completed working with the municipalities and working with the City of Toronto through the technical working group. So that is a discussion that's going to be ongoing, and the local boards of health clearly understand that. Final supplementary. Well, from the responses of this minister, I think what everybody clearly understands is she has no plan. It's cut, cut, cut without a plan, Speaker. This government has given regional public health providers no reason whatsoever to trust them because they have no plan. Inside, come Cuts are um, uh, announced by the day around here. Schemes are drawn up on the back of napkins with zero consultation. And in the midst of all of this chaos, Inside, organizational structures and transitional plans are nowhere to be seen. Instead of plowing ahead with reckless cut speaker and plans to eliminate 25 out of 35 health units, why does not the government reverse these cuts and work with public health units to keep Ontarians healthy and safe and actually contributing to the end of hallway medicine. Stop the clock. We are five minutes into question period. I think the government side would expect and anticipate that the speaker should be paying attention to the questions that are being asked. I need to be able to hear the questions. It's completely out of order and very disrespectful to the whole House for so many it's a not all the government members, clearly, but a, a number of government members just screaming across the floor. It's unacceptable behaviour. Start the clock. Minister to reply. 
Thank you very much, Speaker. And again, through you, I'd like, I would like to say, let's talk about chaos. Let's look at what we inherited last June when we became government, a $15 billion deficit, health care system in chaos, no long-term care beds for people, 33,000 people waiting for a long-term care bed, 1,000 people a day being treated in hospital hallways and storage rooms, and wait lists everywhere, no mental health and addictions plan. We have a plan that has been clearly articulated to the people of Ontario. A plan to modernize our health care system, to bring it into the 21st century. Making sure that we can streamline and modernize our public health system is very important. Public health is important, and the local public health units are being given enough money to make sure that they can cover all the essentials, vaccinations, school programs, helping people with special Response. needs. They will be able to do that, and we look forward to working alongside them through the transition teams to figure out the exact details. But make no mistake, there is a plan, and we are following through on that plan. Thank you. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question to the pre is to the Premier, but I can assure the Minister that chaos is in the mirror for her and her Premier. <laughs> Yesterday, uh, Toronto Council passed a motion asking the province to reverse cuts to public health, child care, paramedic and other services. It won the support of every councillor who was not the Premier's nephew. <laughs> like municipalities across Ontario, Toronto is warning that they will either have to make deep cuts or issue second Doug Ford tax hike of up to $180. I'm going to interrupt the Leader of the Opposition. We refer to each other by our, our ministerial title or our rights. The, the member can continue. Or issue, or issue a second Ford government tax hike of up to $180 per household. What does the Premier prefer? Premier? Through, through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I, I don't have to be taught any lessons from the Leader of the Opposition about how the city spends their money. I'll tell you that. I've never seen more wasted money in my entire life because I spent four years down there straightening out the mess of a previous government. All there's been is increases in taxes and spending. The people of Toronto have to look at one thing. Look at their tax bill, look at their water bill, look at their garbage bill. The taxes have gone through the roof. When I was in the city of Toronto, we main, maintained a 0% tax increase yeah. the Opposition very first board. year, found $774 million. Right now, the city of Toronto, Mr. Speaker, when I left, it was a $9.6 billion budget, so over $13 billion. That's almost a 50 per cent increase Response. in spending. Wow. They have to start looking at watering stumps. That's what they're wasting money on, yep. watering stumps of trees, yep. having a fleet of cars, $10 million fleet of cars downstairs, sitting there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, sadly, Toronto is not alone. Municipalities across Ontario are facing the exact same challenge. The Region Appeal says that they now face a $45 million shortfall thanks to the Ford government cuts. The Mayor of Ottawa says the city budget has been thrown into a period of chaos. And Toronto says that they're caught between a rock and a rock. <laughs> the Premier said that he would avoid deep cuts, layoffs, and tax hikes. I want to re repeat that, Speaker. The Premier said he would avoid deep cuts, layoffs, and tax hikes. Why is he now offering the people of Ontario all three? Hey, Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker. The people of this province elected us to straighten out the financial mess that the Liberals and the NDP put us in. When we came down here, we opened the books, found out a $15 billion deficit. We're the largest debt, sub-sovereign debt in the entire world. The future of the, the young people up in the stands is at risk. If we don't take care, if we don't take care of the budget, look at the finances. We have two choices in this province, Mr. Speaker. We can go with socialism, 
that doesn't work anywhere in the world, continuously spend money, lose 300,000 jobs like the previous administration, yep. or you can find efficiencies in government. Yep. You can create 175,000 yeah, yeah. jobs that we did. It was unprecedented. We're lowering taxes on business, lowering taxes on residents, making sure we lower heating costs, gas costs. That's being responsible. Socialism does not work. Final supplementary. Well, the problem for the Premier Speaker is that no matter how many people he blames or how loud he bellows, the people of Ontario just don't believe him anymore. He's only, his only ally left at City Hall is his nephew. It right. seems he can't show his face in public without getting booed. It's time, isn't it time for the Premier now, Speaker, to finally admit that his reckless cuts will, in fact, make life, life less affordable Inside, and door. destroy services that families rely on? Government side, come to order. Premier to reply. Speaker, they, they, they can get personal. They can talk about my nephew that has is the only person down there with a fiscal bone in his body, yeah, yeah, yeah. the only he person that cares more. about the taxpayers. He's a super bright young man that would run circles around each and every one of them. Here, here. If there's someone taking care of finances, I'd let him take care of my finances over the leader of the opposition. Because it was up to the leader of the opposition. She's already bankrupt every single person in this province. She'd continue to spend and tax without worrying about anything. If you want to take care of health care, if you want to take care of education, we have to drive efficiencies. Here, here. We found 8% efficiencies through the great work of our team and the finance minister. We're putting money back in the pockets of each and every Ontario resident. But even more importantly, Mr. Spons? Speaker, the economy's on fire because we've created the environment to thrive and prosper and grow in this province, the likes of which this province I apologize to the Premier having to cut him off. I could not hear what he was saying. <laughs> Restart the clock. The next question, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier. Uh, yesterday, the Premier insisted that uh, officials at the Toronto District School Board were lying when they pointed out the reckless classroom cuts in the Ford government budget. <coughs> Today, the Waterloo Region Catholic Board reports that they too will be facing a steep funding cut despite increased enrolment. And the Thames Valley Board in London says that they're planning to eliminate 300 teaching jobs. Uh, does the Premier think that these uh, school boards are also making reckless, inaccurate claims? The question is to the Premier. Minister of Education. Referred to the Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much. And on behalf of the Premier and our entire government, I want to suggest to everyone in this House that they need to tone down the rhetoric because you're doing nothing but creating anxiety and stress Order. for teachers and students and parents alike. Because I want to refer to an article that was in the Woodstock Sentinel Review just today, well, and it's coming from the Thames Valley School Board. While no teachers are in danger of losing their jobs, they may be just changing their roles, said the school board associate director. There are no layoffs as a result and of because of these retirements that we talked about right from the get-go, Speaker. So the fact of the matter is, school board to school Order. board to school board, we're hearing from some from Eastern Ontario that they're choosing not to jump into the game that the party opposite is trying to Once. facilitate. They are not going to make things political. They're going to wait for all the pieces of the puzzle to come together so that they can have a holistic approach to making sure that they have the right balance when it comes to the school year. Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, students and their parents are watching with dismay as teachers get layoff notices and courses disappear. And it's not just Toronto. Government side, come to order. Students at Brampton's intent. The clock. Top the clock. Government side will come to order. Or I will start naming you individually and calling you to order individually, if, ne if necessary, warning, if necessary, naming. Start the clock. The Leader of the Opposition had the floor. 
Students at Brampton Centennial learned that 30 classes were being cut next school year. Neighbouring Mayfield Secondary is losing 42 courses. The Thames Valley Board says that 1,620 different classes will disappear next year across that school board. These cuts are depriving students of opportunities to learn. Why doesn't the Premier have the integrity to at least admit that his cuts have consequences? Minister. I ask right back to the Leader of the Opposition, where is her integrity? Because she is continuing to fester and propagate misinformation that is absolutely misleading parents and students and teachers. I'm going to ask the Minister to withdraw. I'm going to ask the Minister to withdraw. And withdraw. You know, Speaker, it, it's actually disheartening the manner in which this opposition party is conducting themselves because when I speak to teachers, they recognize and are explicitly pointing out how friends of the party opposite are playing games. Those friends are creating a lot of chaos, and I encourage all school boards from one end of this province to another to do the right thing. Students should not have to suffer because of the games the party opposite and their friends are playing. Do you know the fact of the matter is we're going to be working with school boards to make sure there Box. is no longer wasteful management with our board governance review, and we look forward to kicking that off in the very near future. The next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. For far too long, regular Ontarians were left behind by their government. Fifteen years of Liberal mismanagement brought higher taxes, less accountability and less transparency in government. Life in Ontario simply became harder under the former Liberal government. Crippling legislation burdened our province with red tape and regulations that held our province back. Thankfully, under the leadership of this Premier, our government has moved rapidly forward, keeping our promises and bringing real change to the people of Ontario. Speaker, can the Premier discuss a few of the accomplishments our government has achieved since the June election? Premier. I want to thank the fabulous MPP from Eglinton Lawrence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the great, great ridings in Toronto. But we have hold more seats in Toronto than any of the other parties, so it says says a lot about our government. Yeah, yeah. We expanded on August 17th. I went on last uh, couple days ago on our accomplishments, and we have such a long list. I'll start off on August 17th. We expanded hospice care in my friend's North Bay riding yeah, yeah. here. We put two million dollars in, ten beds and supported the hospice care there. On August the 22nd, we gave parents a voice with public education. For the first time ever, they actually had a voice. We heard from 72,000 parents, the largest consultation in Ontario's history. We lowered energy costs after, after the we lowered energy costs after the the Liberals and the NDP have jacked energy costs up to be the highest in North America that people couldn't afford to pay their hydro bills. Companies couldn't afford to pay their Thank you. Bills. Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, regular Ontarians were left high and dry for 15 years under the former Premier Kathleen Wynne and Dalton McGuinty. Hard-working families in rural and northern Ontario were not supported by their government. Entrepreneurs and small business owners were not supported by their government. And, Speaker, our students were not supported by their government. The widespread desire for change in our province could not have been more clear when Ontarians headed to the polls last year. A government based on trust, accountability and transparency resonated across the province. Mr. Speaker, could the Premier expand further on the policies our government has brought forward to deliver on our promises for the great people of Ontario? Before I ask the Premier to respond, to remind all members we refer to each other by our ministerial title or our riding, where, where, however it's applicable. Premier to reply. I want to thank a great uh, member from Eglinton Lawrence once again for the question. 
We, on August the 29th, we have a long list here. There's no government that's accomplished more in less than a year than we have ever, ever. Gave people a voice to decide the future of government services on August 29th. On August 30th, we committed to upholding free speech on publicly funded universities yeah, yeah. and colleges. Mr. Speaker, when I travel around universities and colleges, a lot of the students came up to me. They were sick and tired of the profs indoctrinating their, their philosophy onto the students. Wouldn't let them have free speech. There's free speech in colleges and universities because of this government. We began building a better regional transit uh, system across Ontario, expanding GoTrain, expanding the $28.5 billion budget that we put forward for the transit system in the Greater Toronto Area because the City of Toronto once again talked for four years, spent millions and hundreds of millions of dollars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, my question is to, to the uh, to the Premier, who seems a little bit rattled this morning. Speaker, I want to start by expressing my condolences to the Premier for uh, being booed yesterday in the first, what he said was the first time ever, by a gang of about a thousand left wing soldiers. Okay, um, stop the call. The member for Mississauga East Cookstill will come to order. Government side will come to order. Start the clock. The member for Essex. Speaker, I hope he's well enough to answer my question. Speaker, with each passing day, the Premier's plan to waste millions of dollars on partisan advertising and forcing businesses to display conservative campaign stickers draws more and more criticism from the left-wing thugs order. and radicals out there. This morning, Speaker, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, a notorious Marxist sect, and the famously left-wing Toronto Sun denounced the Premier's plan. Speaker, is he finally willing to reconsider his colossal waste of public money and ab uh, abandon his wasteful plan? Stop the clock again. Stop the clock. Once again, I would implore the government members to allow me to hear the questions that are being asked. I, I can't follow the questions when, when there's constant yelling from the government side. You'd expect me to enforce the standing orders, I think, and I can't if you're yelling constantly from the government side at the member who's got the floor and is asking the question. Start the clock. The Premier to reply. To you, Mr. Speaker, uh, first of all, last night was a, a great opening, fabulous opening, so many smiles on these kids' faces. They were so encouraged. They, they were absolutely so encouraged. Great, great event. And, uh, you know, I find it ironic coming from the member from Essex, but he didn't even bother showing up. At least we showed up. He didn't even bother showing up, and neither did the leader of the opposition. So the, the throwing stones in Glass House is pretty, pretty staggering. I want to remind the, the member from Essex, I've spent my whole life helping children with special needs through Rotary. Mr. Speaker, for 23 years, I helped through Rotary, uh, going to events, helping children. Yep. That's what that's what it's all about. It's not about getting into gutter politics yep. and worrying about if you get a cheer or a boo. It's about being there for the Showing kids. Because you know something, Mr. Just Speaker, show. it wasn't the kids. Show up. I can tell you they were happy there. And we're going to continue supporting the Special Olympics. Just show up. Order. Order. Government side, come to order. Supplementary. Three question. Speaker, it sounds like the folks at the event last night would have wished that the Premier hadn't showed up at all. <laughs> Speaker. The fact is, Speaker, with his plan, the Premier has. Yeah, the government side will come to order. Start the clock. The member for Essex has the floor. Thank you very much, Speaker. With his plan, the Premier has now united virtually everyone in the province against him. When the Chamber of Commerce, the Taxpayers Federation, 
and the Toronto Sun say that the Ford government has got it wrong. They have truly lost their way. Instead of trying to defend the indefensible, why doesn't the Premier finally admit that this can't be defended? Stop forcing businesses to carry Conservative campaign stickers. Stop wasting taxpayers' money and abandon this partisan ad campaign today. Premier. Minister of Finance. Referred to the Minister of Finance. Well, thank you very much. You know, Speaker. The business community, uh, the Premier and I were in New York a couple of weeks ago, and I'll tell you, the business community there, as well as the business community in Ontario, thrilled with what we're doing. $880 million savings from cutting the carbon tax, $1.3 billion saved by freezing minimum wage at $14 and giving the businesses a chance to get caught up. $1.4 billion savings by freezing the WSIB, $1.4 billion reinvested through the accelerated capital cost, $300 million we did not increase the Liberal tax backed by the NDP, 170,000 jobs created as a result of the support. I think the business community has spoken very loud and very clear that they're open. they know we're open for business and open for jobs. Start the clock. The next question, the member from Mississauga Mall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is regarding public safety, and it is for the Solicitor General. Mr. Speaker, this week there was an Amber Alert. It was issued for a missing boy. When a child is missing, police and first responders are in a race against time to prevent a potential nightmare for affected families and community at large. This alert system can be a true lifeline. Mr. Speaker, this is a great way to work together. When an Amber Alert is issued, the police and the public work together to share information, locate the missing child, and bring him or her home safe and sound. For public interest and information, can the Solicitor General please explain how the Amber Alert system works and why it is vital for the speedy recovery of our missing children in communities across Ontario. Thank you, Mr. The Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. You know, the member from Mississauga Mall is absolutely right. The, uh, when a child is missing, time is of the essence and absolutely critical. Amber Alerts make safe return for these children uh, critical and is, frankly, a shared priority and responsibility for all of us. We thank the police and all Ontarians who take the time and effort to increase their vigilance when they receive an Amber Alert. They're doing their part, and we need to do our part as uh, citizens. Amber Alerts are issued through the National, National uh, Ready Alert System in Ontario. The OPP sends Amber Alerts at the request of local police services. A number of recent Amber Alerts have led directly to police finding those children and often many, many hundreds of miles away from where they were taken. So the fact that Amber Alerts go province-wide is critical to uh, assisting the police. I thank them for their service, and I really hope that everyone understands the importance of the Amber Alert system. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Thanks for the amazing explanation of the Amber Alert system. It is important and it works. Recent Amber Alerts have unfortunately resulted in some complaints. We all have heard stories of people calling 911 to complain their sleep has been disturbed, about their TV time has been interrupted. These complaints happened again yesterday when the Toronto Police Services tweeted that their communication centers, 911 lines, were being used for this purpose. Ms. Speaker, can the Solicitor General share her views regarding people who have used the 911 number as a complaint hotline while officers were scrambling to find our missing child? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, the Solicitor General. Thank you. And, uh, and the member raises a disturbing and, frankly, unfortunate uh, situation. He's absolutely right. The uh, 911 uh, system, which I think we can all appreciate is an emergency response system, uh, has been used by a very limited number of Ontario residents to complain about Amber uh, uh, Alerts. Uh, it's not only inappropriate, it's frankly 
dangerous. Um, people who use 911 as a complaint hotline are using up critical emergency resources and potentially slowing down response times during real emergencies. When a child is missing, we all have a role to play as members within our community. Many children have been located as a direct result of Amber Alerts and, as I said previously, often hundreds of kilometres away from where the child was taken. But, Speaker, it only works if everyone receives them and pays attention to them. You know, you don't have to know the child to be vigilant and aware of the information that is shared with, with the system. Now, the bottom line is clear. A missing child is an emergency. And Amber Alerts are a tool that we use, that our emergency responders use, to uh, successfully retrieve these children. Please understand and appreciate that 911 is not a complaint line. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, in the estimates released uh, last week, we saw that this government is reducing capital investment into childcare by $90 million, actually over $90 million this year. This rep represents about 90% cut in childcare capital funding this year, dramatically limiting the number of new spaces, uh, new childcare spaces that could have been built under this government. Can the Premier explain how cutting capital funding and capital investments into new childcare spaces by 90 per cent will address the shortage of affordable, quality childcare in Ontario? Questions to the Premier. Minister of Education. Referred to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Speaker. And again, we're getting childcare back on track in Ontario after 15 years of a lack of accountability. You know, there was a letter just written to me on May 13th, and it came from the Association of Daycare Operators of Ontario. And uh, in the letter, it said, you know, having worked provincially with licensed child care owner operators located in the GTA, for example, for more than 30 years, ADCO has the understanding that further investigation into how municipalities, specifically the City of Toronto and other Ontario municipalities, should be conducted, because it may be that there hasn't been enough oversight over the last 15 years. And the reason for suggesting this is simple. Like a number of other Ontario municipalities, the City of Toronto has been engaged in practices Response. that we believe are less than optimal if the goal is to expand access to licensed childcare, make it more affordable for families, or optimize provincial dollars allocated for these purposes. Speaker, we're getting childcare back on track. Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary question. Th thank you, Speaker. I just want to clarify to the minister, my question was about these uh, capital investment cuts for about $93.6 million, in case the minister has no clue about that. This huge reduction in capital funding, through you, Speaker, is yet another child care cut for parents to come uh, to terms with. So far, this government has cut the funding for municipalities uh, that receive to support uh, daycare subsidies uh, operating costs, which is about 6,000 spaces that are at risk now. And they're cutting funding that helps keep child care. Uh, Order. Stop the clock. The member for Scarborough Southwest has the floor. She should be allowed to ask her question without interjections. I ask once again the government side to come to order. And I'm going to give her some extra time so that she can ask her question. I'd like to know who said that because I would warn them if I knew. Start the clock. Member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, we're facing a child care crisis, and the fact that this government is trying to shut me down from me asking my question is disrespectful. It's extremely disrespectful because we're facing a child care crisis, and people are suffering. Children are suffering, and it's not. Stop the clock. I'm going to. I'm going to call the Minister for Government and Consumer Services to order. I'm going to call the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade to order. I'm going to call the member for Mississauga East Cooksville to order. Start the clock. Start the clock. The member can ask her question. Thank you, Speaker. 
My question is to this government. When is this government going to start listening to parents and actually invest in proper child care? Thank you very much. Members, please take their seats. Minister of Education may reply. Speaker, I, in my um, first response, I addressed the mismanagement and operating funds. Now let's talk about, and I talked about getting child care back on track. Now let's talk about the investment that we're making. We're investing upwards of $2 billion to get child care back on track. We're, uh, we are creating 30,000 new spaces, 10,000 of which are going to be in schools. And, Speaker, we're doing so much more. We're working with our partners. We're ensuring daycare finally is accessible, affordable, and flexible for parents. We're allowing parents to have access to home care if they work shift work. We're, we're making things right in this province, if, if um, previously under the, the Liberal administration, if you had a child in grade one and a child in JK, you can drop them off at the Y for a before or after school program. Now they can do so because yeah. we've listened to parents and we're getting it Response. right. Parents have asked us to make childcare affordable, accessible and flexible, and that's exactly what we're doing, no matter what anyone opposite says. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last week, I travelled to Sudbury for the Phnom Conference. I was fortunate to meet so many municipal leaders from Northeast Ontario. Many leaders expressed concern about this government's callous and cruel changes to our health care system. Of particular concern is the downloading of costs to the municipalities with no consultation. The government's cuts force the Ontario Telemedicine Network to let go 15 per cent of its employees. Last year, the OTN conducted 900,000 patient consultations and saved nearly $72 million in travel grants. The OTN enables greater access to health care services in regions where distances are vast. Think of the vast geography of the North. The truth is, cuts go deeper in the North. Why is this government advancing policies that disproportionately disadvantage Northern Ontario, many of whom already have Question. difficulties accessing services? You know, one of the Northern reps says, when you cut telehealth, this cuts deeper in the North. Why are you doing that, Premier? I'm going to call the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services to order. Premier to reply. Minister of Municipal Affairs. To the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the opportunity to uh, talk about the fact that uh, uh, the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport were, and I were also at uh, Phnom uh, last week in Sudbury. Uh, we enjoyed our interaction with municipal uh, officials from, uh, from the north. But you know, uh, Speaker, you know, through you, you know what the, the member opposite didn't talk about? She didn't talk about her record in government, where, where we Ontario. were saddled with a $15 billion yeah. deficit, yeah. and after 15 years of waste management yeah. and, and scandal, we were elected on June the 7th last year to clean up that fiscal mess. We are protecting what matters most. But at the same time, Speaker, we're continuing our dialogue with our municipal partners. The Phnom meeting was excellent. We had a great opportunity to exchange uh, information regarding the priorities of the North. But you know, make no mistake, this member didn't talk about her record nope. when she was up in Sudbury. Thought Barry was Northern Ontario. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, in fact, my record was brought up. Uh, when I was minister, I increased funding for mental health services in the north, recognizing the unique needs that are in the community. I'm glad the Minister of Tourism and Culture was there, Speaker, because the inter- library loans also came up and it was a sore point which this loan allows northern and rural libraries to access resources at low cost and it's another casualty of this government's slash and burn agenda it's a small thing speaker but it signals that there is importance in north-south relationships by exchanging of books. Libraries are one of the easiest, most cost-effective ways to allow people, regardless of their socioeconomic backgrounds, a chance to learn and to grow. Education is a right. 
limiting people's access to the knowledge is irresponsible governance. What? Does this Premier think that taking books away from seniors and kids is an effective way to balance the budget? The question has been referred to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I will take no lesson from this member. Who one of her ministers referred to the North as no man's land. So I will take no lessons from her. In fact, Speaker, she should talk about her record. As Minister of Education, she's closed many, many rural schools, rural schools in my riding, rural schools all across this province. Order. I will take no lesson from that member regarding her lack of, of, of standing up for rural municipalities and northern municipalities in terms of education. I'll take no lessons from that member in terms of the $15 billion deficit she saddled both myself but also my children and my grandchildren. We were elected on June 7th to clean up their mess. That's what we're going to do. The independent members will come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Milton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Finance. A little over a month ago, our government unveiled our plan to protect what matters most through our first budget. Every member of our caucus is proud to stand in this legislature and support the plan we have put forward. After 15 years of liberal tax and spend policies, Ontarians were left footing the bill with nothing to show for it. Those days are over, Mr. Speaker. We're giving $26 billion in relief to Ontario hardworking families, individuals, and businesses. Today, we're taking another step forward in making that plan a reality. As the minister prepares to begin third reading on protecting what matters most act this afternoon, could he share the work we're doing to bring relief to Ontario families? Minister Finance. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Milton. We have made it clear that we are protecting what matters most and we are putting people first, and that is why our budget includes the CARE tax credit. CARE is designed to give parents, not the government, control over the choices they make for their children and provides 300,000 families with up to 75 per cent of their eligible childcare expenses. Speaker, that is why our budget also introduces a $90 million investment in dental care for 100,000 low-income seniors, $1.75 billion for a five-year investment in new long-term care beds, $1.4 billion Lots. investment for school renewals this year alone. We're cleaning up the financial mess we inherited from the previous government, and we're disappointed the NDP aren't supporting the seniors. Supplementary once again, the member for Milton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a relief to see a government respecting the hardworking families and individuals of Ontario, putting money back in people's pockets and putting people first. Our government is also bringing much-needed relief to the job creators of our province. For far too long, businesses have been told they need to do more for the government, and they have been burdened with higher taxes and unnecessary red tape. Those days are over as well, Mr. Speaker. Ontario is now open for business and open for jobs, and we're seeing the results. Businesses are growing, investments are returning to Ontario, and jobs are being created. Could the minister inform the House on the action our budget takes to bring relief to businesses in Ontario? 
Minister of Finance again. Thank you, Speaker. In addition to supporting families and seniors, our budget also shows that Ontario is open for business and open for jobs. The Ontario Job Creation Investment Incentive will provide ca uh, uh, faster capital investment write-offs, encouraging businesses to immediately invest in Ontario and create new jobs. We scrapped the Liberal cap-and-trade carbon tax, paused the increase in minimum wage, lowered WSIB premiums, stopped the $300 million in new Liberal taxes that were supported by the NDP. Speaker, we have created the environment where businesses can and will succeed. And again, that's why 170,000 jobs have been created since Premier Ford was elected. Our plan is working. Ontario is open for business and open for jobs, and our results speak for themselves. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the Thames Valley District School Board released a preliminary review of what the government's cuts to education will mean to students in the London area. The associate director of the board said that what it comes down to is, and I quote, less choice for students. Speaker, the board is projecting 329 fewer teachers over four years, which means 1,620. 20 secondary school courses will no longer be offered. That's a lot of shop classes, technology classes, photography, drama, Indigenous studies, law, horticulture, arts, and music classes gone. The kind of programs that excite students and get them to school in the morning. Will the Premier admit that his cuts to education are taking away opportunities for students and jeopardizing their futures? Questions to the Premier? Minister of Education. Burke, the Minister of Education. Thank you very much. And you know, Speaker, it's an absolute honor every day to stand in this house and tell everyone listening and present how we're getting education back on track. Because no matter what gets said by any of the members in the opposition party, they're doing nothing but fear mongering. And you know, people are getting very tired of it because the fact of the matter is, we are excited by what our plan holds, given the reaction that we're getting. In terms of opportunities, we're actually focusing in on what matters in terms of ensuring students have the life skills and the job skills. We're investing over $2 million over five years in financial literacy. We are increasing our investment in STEM. By $66.5 million, we're increasing awareness and exposure to technology and skilled Spons. trades and apprenticeship programs. Do you know the fact of the matter is we're increasing our, our investment, if you will, in math funding, and we're getting Indigenous curriculum right once and for all. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. What the official opposition is doing is actually sharing what the school boards are saying. Uh, school boards are very clear about the impact of the layoffs on students. Uh, in Thames Valley, they were also clear that attrition funding will not come close to making up the loss of $17 million in base teacher funding that has been cut. The school board is also losing 100 positions that were funded by the local priorities grant, including educational assistants, social workers, and other other education workers who support students with special learning needs. Speaker, cutting supports for students with special needs, eliminating 1,620 classes will deny students opportunities to learn new skills, explore their interests, and achieve their potential. Does the Premier really think that removing special education supports and limiting opportunity will help students succeed? The question has been referred to the Minister of Education. Members will please take their seats. Speaker. You know, I'm actually very disappointed in that member opposite because she knows better 
We, if she had read the budget, she would have seen we're investing in special education, and our partners in education know we are committed to investing over and above what was uh, absolutely off track by the previous administration. We're investing $90 million. We're getting special education back on track after so many years of uh, oversight and, uh, uh, and absolutely disarray. So the fact of the matter is, I'm disappointed in the member opposite as well, because she's cherry-picking out of an article. Um, Order. She chose not to read this particular quote. While no teachers are in danger excuse me, of losing their jobs, they may be changing rules. Speaker, people are seeing through this thin veil of rhetoric. And they're coming to Response. us saying they're tired of the nonsense and the encouragement yep. that we're getting and the support we're getting to get education back on track is phenomenal. Again, we're investing seven. Thank you. Thank you. The next question. The member for Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you. My question is for the Solicitor General. Mr. Speaker, we formed government on a, on a promise to provide police with the tools, resources and supports they need to do their jobs effectively. This includes new facilities that are capable to meet the demands of modern police operations. After 15 years of liberal neglect, our government is making investments to keep our communities safe and last fall, our government announced a $182 million investment to replace several aging OPP facilities with nine new detachments across the province. Mr. Speaker, could the Solicitor General please update the members of the Legislature on how these new OPP detachments will improve public safety across Ontario? Questions to the Solicitor General. Thank you. Thank you to the member from uh, Mississauga Streetsville for her question, but more importantly for hosting uh, my friend and colleague, the Minister of Infrastructure, and I on Monday, where we were able to announce in her riding of Mississauga Streetsville a groundbreaking for a new OPP detachment that will focus yeah, yeah. on highway safety. It's, uh, this $20 million investment will ensure Ontarians can continue to receive the modern, cost-efficient and first-class road and highway safety services they deserve. For over a century, the OPP have protected law-abiding families and citizens across our province. As this new building takes place, it will be a source of pride for the entire OPP operation, as well as the people who rely on them to keep Ontario's busiest highways safe. Our actions taken together send a clear message that we, while we rely on the OPP to have our backs, the OPP can Response. be confident that Premier Ford and our government has theirs. Here, Thank here, you. Here, here. Supplementary question. Thank you to the Solicitor General for that excellent response. It's encouraging to hear about our government's commitment to giving our OPP the tools they need to keep our roads safe. They do great work. Mr. Speaker, a $20 million investment is no small feat. The previous Liberal government, supported by the opposition NDP, left this province with a $15 billion deficit. When it comes to critical projects like this, it is important that our government gets it right. Will the Solicitor General please tell us more about how our government is going about this project done in a responsible manner? Thank you. The Solicitor General. I would like to refer the supplementary to the Minister of Infrastructure. Here, here. We'll get to the Minister of Infrastructure. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member uh, from Mississauga Streetsville and a number of uh, caucus members for joining us uh, for this uh, important announcement. Mr. Speaker, this week is Police Week, an opportunity to support our police officers, our OPP, and all they do to keep our families safe. Mr. Speaker, I was with the Solicitor General on Monday to do just that. I agree with the member. With projects like this, it's important that we get it right. Having been left with a fiscal mess by the previous government, we're committed to finding smart ways to build infrastructure in the right place and at the right time. I'm happy to say, Mr. Speaker, that this state-of-the-art facility will be delivered through a public-private partnership through our agency, Infrastructure Ontario. IO has a proven track record Response. of delivering projects on time and on budget. Mr. Speaker, we're putting people at the uh, centre of every decision that we make, and we're keeping our roads safe and supporting the great work done 
by the Ontario Provincial Police. Thank you. Next question, the member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. The Conservatives' budget cuts are expected to cost the Peel region $45 million. Wow. The Premier talks about making life more affordable, yet these cuts are doing the exact opposite. By downloading costs, the Peel region will be forced to increase property tax by $68 per family while cutting programs and services that families rely on. Why does this Conservative government believe in both cutting services and raising taxes for Bramptonians? The questions to the Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Referred to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, thanks Speaker. Um, we've made it very clear, Speaker, in every speech that I've given since I was appointed Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, at every consultation that I've had with our municipal partners, I've indicated that we were in a financial mess. We, after 15 years of waste, mismanagement, and scandal, supported 97 per cent by uh, position by come to order. Um, we needed to take a, a different fiscal path, and we asked every one of our partners, just like we were looking at every line and every program and every service, we asked our partners to do the same. So, I, I, you know, again, I, I find it passing strange that this member would would bring this up because we've been extremely clear. Crystal, um, we we have a budget that the finance minister budgets. has tabled that protects uh, what matters most to Ontarians: health and education. And we've asked every single. Uh, organization that we do business Response. with to look for efficiencies as well. I, you know, the, one of the, the very first bills I put on the table was to uh, to look at the city of Toronto and make it more effective and more efficient. We saved them 25 million dollars that they went ahead and spent on other things. So, thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The people of Brampton were left behind by the last Liberal government. This Conservative government is taking things from bad to worse with its cuts to health care and education. Now the region of Peel is facing cuts to housing, child care and social assistance. On top of it all, the Premier's tax hike of $68 per family will make life even more unaffordable. Brampton is the ninth largest city in this country and is one of the fastest growing. People need investment to ensure that people of Brampton receive the resources and services they deserve, not more cuts. Will the Premier cancel his tax hike, reverse these cuts, and give Peel Region the support that it deserves? Question has been referred to the Minister of Municipal Affairs. In fact, uh, Speaker, what the Honourable Member forgets is the mayor of Brampton, who he refers to, was once the leader of the opposition, and he talked about the importance of reining in deficits so that we can protect what the, 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 the programs that matter most to Ontarians. His, his mayor preached the same uh, fiscal restraint when he sat in this legislature, uh, as did, quite frankly, Mayor Tory when he was leader of the opposition. Oh my gosh, yes. So again, Speaker, we've, no. we've worked with our municipal partners, 405 out of Ontario's 444 municipalities received funds in the last fiscal year, some $200 million to provide municipal modernization, to look at shared service agreements, to look at, at, at doing things differently, trying to provide uh, efficiencies and effective uh, spending. You know, uh, you know, again, we will continue to consult our municipal partners. We have a process with both AMO and the City of Toronto. We will continue to talk to our partners Response. about how we can work together on making sure that we're an effective and efficient yes. partnership. But make no She's mistake, not. Speaker, I want to be perfect. Thank you. Thank you. The next question. The member for Brampton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. We know the minister represented the people of Ontario by speaking against Bill C-69 at the Senate hearings in Ottawa. He stood up for Ontario's nuclear energy sector because it is an integral part of our economy and it's a success story everyone in this province should be proud of. Yeah. Our government for the people respects the nuclear industry, which is why we extended the life of the Pickering Generation Station. We protected those jobs, and we are very lucky to have the minister responsible for the energy who champions Ontario's nuclear sector. Yeah. Bill C-69 threatens this job-creating sector of our economy 
and our government will never stand by while misguided legislation is being proposed. Can the minister please tell us more about why our government is opposed to Bill C-69? Good question. Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mining. Mr. Speaker, in terms of energy across this country, and in terms of energy infrastructure, uh, in this country, Mr. Speaker, the member from Brampton West couldn't be more right. This is of national concern, Mr. Speaker. This bill has the, the potential impact to shut down, Mr. Speaker, major energy projects across this country. In Ontario, we will not stand idly by as scaled-up nuclear projects are now going to be at risk at this bill. Major hydro dam projects, Mr. Speaker, will be at risk as a result of this. Some of the largest natural gas uh, infrastructure expansions plans that we have in this province will be at risk. Mr. Speaker, we stand by the newly minted and terrific energy minister from Alberta, Minister Sonia Savage, Minister Bronwyn Ear, two great women in Saskatchewan Response. and Alberta who stand with us against this for the projects it represents, Mr. Speaker, that will be at risk in their provinces, at risk here in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and put the entire country's energy future at risk. That's a fact. Thank you. Question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to thank the minister for his answer. Ontarians can take comfort knowing that our government will not stand by while burdensome regulations are imposed on our industries that will take our country backwards. Mr. Speaker, it's clear that with Bill C-69 and Trudeau's carbon tax, the federal government is waging a war against the most important industries that create good jobs in Canada and Ontario. We believe Bill C-69 contradicts several of Canada's economic goals and it would grind to a halt natural resources and economic development across the country and certainly in Ontario. This is unacceptable for our government. We believe in creating renewed economic opportunities for all the people of this province. Can the minister please highlight why this bill would be so detrimental to Canada and Ontario's economic success? Thank you. Minister again to reply. I, I, I'd, be, I'd be happy to, Mr. Speaker, but something tells me I don't have to. Listen to what the Canadian uh, Manufacturers and Exports CEO said this morning. Manufacturers in every region of the country see Bill C-69 as a direct threat to future resource development and the well-being of their essential suppliers and customers. Diane Francis, a real columnist, Mr. Speaker, with the Financial Post, said, obviously, resource de development will stop cold. This is a bill written by economic ignoramuses. This is not legislation. This is sabotage. Mr. Speaker, it gets worse. We know the NDP have been in cahoots with the Liberals provincially and federally. The former member of Brampton East, Mr. Speaker, announced that gas and oil pipelines, Mr. Speaker, the whole sector is off limits for them, Mr. Speaker. Why is the provincial NDP fine for Bill C-69? Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. I interrupt that Andrew Shear campaign ad with a question for the Premier. <laughs> Days ago, we learned that the Ottawa public health boundaries will be massively expanded from Kingston all the way to the Quebec border without any additional resources. Speaker, covering 29,000 square kilometres and about 1.7 million people, this new public health unit will be forced to do more with less. Dr. Paul Romiliota, CEO of the Eastern Ontario Health Unit, warns, and I quote, the bigger the health unit, the less local ability to taper your needs to your community programs and to the population's needs. Not fear-mongering, Speaker, fact-mongering by experts. Will the Premier listen to health care experts and put the brakes on this reckless decision? Questions to the Premier. Minister of Health. Referred to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Speaker. In fact, what we are doing is modernizing the system as we're modernizing our total health system to be able to respond to the crises that are, are going to occur, we know, from time to time. But we want to make sure that the local public health units have the resources that they need in order to do their work. In fact, we've heard from many of them that the smaller units are having trouble attracting the, the people with the skills and the experience that they need in order to do their work. With the changes that we are making, they will be enabled, they will be able to get the the people that they need to do the work, and they will be able to concentrate on the areas within their specific geographic area, while the uh, province uploads some of the bigger picture campaigns like anti-smoking campaigns and so on that will allow the local units to be able to tend to their own geographic area and their own concerns, Bonds. which vary from place to place, as the member will know. 
supplementary question. The member for Kingston and the Islands. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and, and through you back to the Premier. When public health is done on the cheap, it, put li it puts lives at risk. Asking a single public health unit to cover vastly different communities with different needs across a huge geographic area is a recipe for disaster. Kingston, Frontenac, Lennox and Addington Public Health is one of the most effective public health units in the province. And I'm sure that the member from Hastings, Lennox and Addington would agree. I've had meetings with stakeholders in the community. They talk about the differences even between Kingston and the rural areas around Kingston, Speaker, and the, and the different needs they have and, and how to serve them. It has led the charge against Lyme disease, developing a physician education program and creating a Lyme network for doctors that was adopted nationally. Our health unit is successful Question. and it knows our community and the surrounding area. In what world, Speaker, does it make sense to dismantle the organizations that are exceeding expectation? Thank you. Minister to reply. that public health units are extremely important and we are going to continue to consult with the public health units going forward with respect to the issues that they're facing and the needs that they have but we need to make sure that they're going to be ready to deal with outbreaks of infectious diseases other things that we know are going to happen and we are confident that with the resources they will be receiving from the ministry of health and long-term care if they concentrate on their priorities which they are required to do as we are required to uh, focus provincial resources on the things that matter most to people, protecting what matters most, they will be able to fulfill their critical components like vaccinations, programs for children with special needs, meals programs, programs for expectant mothers and others. I am confident that with the monies they will be receiving Response. and with the boundaries that will be decided upon in consultation with the units and with municipalities, they will be able to do their e effective work uh, continuing now and into the future. Here, here. That concludes question period for this morning. I'm going to remind members that the standing orders provide for five minutes for introduction of guests in the morning before question period and in the afternoon at one o'clock, but I've been asked by the member for Niagara Falls. Uh, to recognize them on a point of order. Thank, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to welcome a couple guests from my riding. Shannon Miller, Matthew Miller, Tanner Uni, Melissa Uni. Thank you very much for coming, and I'm sure you enjoyed question period this morning. Thank you. The government House Leader on a point of order. Speaker, uh, I seek unanimous consent to put forward a motion without notice regarding the late show for the member from Kitchener Centre, scheduled for tonight, uh, Wednesday, May 15, 2019. Government House Leader is seeking the unanimous consent of the House to put forward a motion without notice regarding the late show tonight regarding the member for Kitchener Centre, scheduled for this evening. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Speaker, I move that the late show scheduled for Wednesday, May 15, 2019, standing in the name of the member for Kitchener Centre, be moved to Tuesday, May 28, 2019. has moved at the late show scheduled for Wednesday, May the 15th, 2019, standing in the name of the member for Kitchener Centre, be moved to Tuesday, May 28, 2019. Is it the pleasure of the House that the motion carry? Carry. Carry. <laughs> we have a deferred vote on the amendment to Government Notice of Motion No. 61 relating to allocation of time on Bill 107, an act to amend the Highway Traffic Act and various other statutes in respect of transportation-related matters. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
going to ask the members to take their seats. On May the 14th, 2019, Mr. Harris moved an amendment to Government Notice of Motion No. 61 relating to allocation of time on Bill 107. All those in favour of Mr. Harris's motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith Bay of Quincy. Mr. Smith Bay of Quincy. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Bethan Fall. Mr. Bethan Fall. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Yurk. Mr. Yurk. Ms. Mulroney. Ms. Mulroney. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Tibolo. Mr. Tibolo. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Calandra. Mr. Calandra. Ms. Serma. Ms. Serma. Mr. Parsa. Mr. Parsa. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Ms. Triantafilopoulos. Ms. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Carhalios. Mrs. Carhalios. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Cho Willard. Mr. Cho Willow. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Ms. Kanjan. Ms. Kanjan. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Cramp. Mrs. Wise. Mrs. Wise. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mr. Anon. Mr. Anon. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Smith Peterborough Quartha. Mr. Smith Peterborough Quartha. Mr. Bauma. Mr. Bauma. Mr. Cosetto. Mr. Cosetto. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Kenapathy. Mr. Kenapathy. Mr. Babikia. Mr. Babikia. Mr. Babber. Mr. Babber. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Tanagasa. Mr. Tanagasa. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. All those opposed to Mrs. Ha Mr. Harris's motion will please rise one at a time and be Mr. recognized by the Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Madame Jelly. Madame Jelly. Mr. Tab. Mr. Tab. Ms. Singh Brampton Centre. Ms. Singh Brampton Centre. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Be Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Carpoche. Carpoche. Mr. Yamanta. Mr. Yamanta. Mr. Lind Mr. Lind Ms. Lindo. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Hamilton. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Ms. Andrews. Ms. Andrews. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Ms. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rakosovich. Mr. Rakosovich. Mr. Harden. Mr. Harden. Ms. Monty Farrell. Monty Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. The ayes are 68, the nays are 43. The ayes being 68 and the nays being 43, I declare the motion carried. <laughs> are the members ready to vote on the main motion as amended? Are you prepared to vote on the main motion as amended? Mr. Hardiman, Mr. Hardiman has moved government notice of motion number 61 relating to allocation of time on Bill 107, an act to amend the Highway Traffic Act and various other statutes in respect of transportation-related matters. Is it the pleasure of the House that the motion carry? Yeah. The amended motion carry. I heard some no's. All those in favour of the motion will please say aye. aye. All those opposed will please say nay. Yeah. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Call in the members. This will be another five-minute bell.
Mr. Hardiman has moved Government Notice of Motion number 61 relating to the allocation of time on Bill 107. All those in favour of the motion, as amended, will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith Bay of Quincy. Mr. Smith Bay of Quincy. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Bethenfall. Mr. Bethenfall. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Yur Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Ms. Maroney. Ms. Maroney. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Mr. Lecher. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Calandra. Mr. Calandra. Ms. Serma. Ms. Serma. Mr. Parson. Mr. Parson. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Ms. Triantafilopoulos. Ms. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Carhalia. Mrs. Carhalia. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Ms. Kanjin. Ms. Kanjin. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Cramp. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mr. Anand. Mr. Anand. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Smith Peterborough Corsa. Mr. Smith Peterborough Corsa. Mr. Bauma. Mr. Bauma. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Cusetto. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Kenapathy. Mr. Kenapathy. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Pei. Mr. Babber. Mr. Babber. Mr. Pei. Mr. Pei. Mr. Tanagaslin. Mr. Tanagaslin. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. All those opposed to the motion as amended, please rise one at a time and Mr. be recognized B by the Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Madam Jelena. Madam Jelena. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Brampton Center. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Carpoche. Carpoche. Ms. Yamanta. Ms. Yamanta. Ms. Linda. Ms. Linda. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Ms. West. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Ms. Singh Brampton. Ms. Andrews. Ms. Andrews. Ms. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Mr. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rakosevich. Mr. Rakosevich. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Ms. Monty Farrell. Ms. Monty Farrell. Ms. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. The ayes are 68, the nays are 44. The ayes being 68 and the nays being 44, I declare the motion carried. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m.